I'd like to welcome everyone. Thanks for, for joining us again tonight. And so tonight we have a real variety, nice program. Uh, something for video people, some and something for just pretty pictures, which would be always a treat. And then also a way to, um, and this would be uh, Ellen Garvey's presentation on you know, organizing your uh, slides. We all take a million slides now, or not slides, a million images. And it's unlike yeah, the, the days of slides where you stored them someplace and figured out where they were. Now you're shooting piles of digital images and you got to find them and you got to find an easy way to find them. So um, anyway, if we could begin, uh, we'll begin tonight with Daryl, who uh, this is processing and comparing the usefulness of raw images uh, on a GoPro. The GoPro. Yeah. Huh? The GoPro. The GoPro. Okay. Hopefully everyone can still see me. They can see the presentation. Oh. Okay. Change the name. Okay. Yep. Change it's change. Well, I okay. That's shrunk, good. I shrunk okay. it down and I will explain, you know, uh why I'm doing this and um and uh, everything else. So anyway, uh, my presentation tonight is talking about the raw image capability of the GoPro. Um, a lot of people have GoPros, uh, so I thought this would be kind of an interesting thing uh, to discuss. And some of the little tweaks or, or gotchas you might run into along the line. Um, so, let's see if I can click through. Yep, here we go. So um, the reason I use a GoPro is that basically when I go into water, I typically take two cameras, my, my main camera, and then I'll typically take a small camera with me uh, just in case. In this case, uh, for years, I have been using a Paralens, um, which is a great little camera. Um, unfortunately, they never actually got raw capabilities. So I had already been planning I was going to get a GoPro and try raw uh, with it. Um, I typically keep this camera mounted on my main camera. Um, the wide angle is very advantageous if a large animal was to come by. Um, you know, those cool marine encounters that I wouldn't be able to catch when my main camera is set up for taking macro photography only, which happens very often due to the underwater conditions being so unpredictable in New England. Um, as I said, you know, latest, the last couple of models of GoPro actually have uh, supported raw capability. Um, they've gotten much better at it. Um, I'll, I'll discuss a little more about that. I have made some mistakes along the way, which I wanted to highlight, and some of the quirks of using RAW on the cam little camera, since so many people have these cameras. Um, and some people even try to start off with underwater photography using little GoPro cameras because, you know, they're, they're fairly in inexpensive, though the price, you know, which does go up. Um, first of all, I do want to say what I'm not going to do. Because uh, otherwise, my presentations will go well. Other than being very long-winded, would go on forever. Uh, I'm not going to do a product review. There are some people that like GoPros. Some people don't like GoPros. Like I said, I was using a pair of lens at one time. Um, I will not be comparing uh, to uh, images to another uh, camera's um, compared to another camera's images. I will not be doing a true deep dive on the camera, and I will not be talking about the video capability of the camera, which is what most people buy it for, and I, that's primarily what I use it for, but there are circumstances I definitely um, use it for taking photos, which is what I want to talk about. Um, quick idea of how I'm actually using the camera. So I do have mounted high up on my main camera, you can see it's actually mounted on one of the handles of my main camera, which is an iClate housing. Um, because I'm using it for video wide angle, having it high up actually works very well for me because I can get access to the controls. Um, not to mention I can flip the uh, filters down. Um, good advertising here for backscatter also. Um, but one of the things that um, I use the camera a lot for is when I'm not using my main camera, which is when I'm using my scooter. So this is a picture of the front of my uh, thruster. Um, as it is, it's a water jet system. And funny enough, the GoPro is actually wider than my scooter. 
which actually tows me around for hours at a time underwater with my camera, um, which is unique when you've you know, been diving as long as I am and you remember these huge scooters. And this actually could be a great topic for a presentation someday using scooters in photography. Anyway, when it's on my scooter, I typically don't have my big camera with me a lot of times just because it's bulk. And I like to just go places where I normally don't go. Um, in this case, I use it for video, but it also because it's at the front of my scooter, I actually use it for macro. Um, the picture here, you can actually see I have backscatters, um, 15, uh, plus 15 macro mate. Um, why? I'll call it a close up. It's hard to say macro with it, but it's close up. And I'll get into that because it's kind of a raw thing. So before I get too far, I do want to quickly do a back up and quickly talk about raw photos. Um, you know, we've heard the term so many times. I want to talk about, you know, where some of the concerns are, where, where the real power of raw is, um, how it deals with smaller cameras. Um, so all we, we all know that raw is basically just a file format. It just grabs all the data from the, the imaging sensor of a camera. Uh, these files are typically larger than JPEG. Uh, they can be compressed uh, to minimize their space on the camera, take more photos. Um, how much information is in a RAW file is completely dependent upon the sensor of the camera. Bigger sensors will have bigger RAW files. Um, my 60 megapixel main camera, um, it's, many meg it's like 50 megabytes per file or something like that. It's pretty absurd. Um, so that means also, it also deals with each sensor of a different resolution, therefore more data uh, for the file. But what's the biggest thing um, you're getting benefit from a raw file is the dynamic range of the sensor. Uh, so dynamic range is basically the extent that the sensor can record the contrast and color differences of what it's seeing. Um, and this is where the true power of raw comes from. Um, and let me, demonstrate this real quick. So you might have heard that when it comes to raw or actually any photography with digital photography, underexposed images can actually contain more raw useful information than overexposed images. In other words, you don't want to blow up your image. And you take a picture of raw and let's say your, your strobe doesn't go off or something, something else happens underwater and you get a photo that is totally black. Because of the dynamic range of the sensor, it's actually recording the light information in there, which allows you to actually resurrect that photo. And this is a lot of what we, we do in Lightroom is pulling out those details that only exist in that raw data. Um, this is why having cameras with raw are, is a big thing, even small cameras. Um, but because you're dealing with smaller sensor cameras and stuff with less data, there is kind of a thing out there that, you know, using a raw file with some of these small cameras, you may not get the, the benefits may not be obvious. Um, they might be just a slightly more than if you were just taking a JPEG just because of lack of data. And this is one of the concerns I had when I was first playing with the Paralens and then started to look up the uh, GoPro and like, well, how much data could it really have um, for its small sensor? And, you know, would that be actually be useful processing in Lightroom? So let me talk a little bit about the, how GoPro does RAW. Um, so they use a different file type, file extension. If you have a Windows machine, of course, you wouldn't necessarily see the extension if you're on an Apple computer. Um, but it's called a GPR file, which literally stands for General Purpose RAW File. Uh, this is an open source uh, type of file. Um, now, the good thing is that it is actually based upon Adobe's uh, digital negative uh, D DNG standard, which means it works perfectly fine in Lightroom, but it also works perfectly fine in the freeware alternative dark table, which I've done presentations on in the past. Um, they both work just as well. Uh, now, the data compression, um, that GoPro has been doing is they have been able to compress the, these little files more um, because, you know, of course, these are little cameras. They have finite uh, battery resources, finite uh, processing on the camera because they're all computers now. 
Um, but this is with the latest cameras, this actually allows them to now do burst photography uh, with raw images, which is you can press the button and it'll take multiple uh, photos in a row. Uh, if you have a subject that's moving past you, or if you just want to um, know you got the, the photo um, by taking multiple ones at the same time. Now, what I did some research, and unfortunately, GoPro hasn't released a lot of information about this, but I did actually find the dynamic range of the raw files used by the GoPro are actually very similar to that of large sensor cameras. Unfortunately, I can't really show a lot of graphics on this because they didn't release a lot of data, and the GoPro image cameras change every year. So whatever data I have um, has been mentioned in the past is probably pretty old. Now, um, it's a I don't think it's 11 stops of dynamic range, which I don't want to really go into what that means because that's a that's a very camera term, but it is very much like that if you had a much larger camera. There's no real difference. And because of that, I'm going to be able to we're going to be able to do some stuff in Lightroom today. Uh, but there were some great caveats uh, to this. It's once again, it's a small camera. Uh, so when you're using RAW, uh, it will take longer. Uh, to take a photo, uh, basically saving that larger file uh, to the storage on the camera. Um, this also includes burst photography. Um, this is one of the first things I ran into um, trying to use RAW. I actually took it on a hike with me, just kind of, you know, let me just take the camera, let me figure it out. And I put it in burst, um, you know, just walking around the woods and stuff. And I would hit the button and then it would just sit there processing for up to 90 seconds. And I'm like, well, this is not gonna work underwater. Well, that's basically what's happening is it'll take a bunch of photos, but then it takes a while to process them and then save them to the drive. So you do have to be aware of that when you're using RAW on these cameras. Um, the other thing is that, as I mentioned before, RAW is taking all the data uh, from the sensor. And what the GoPros use, and it's had several names in the past, they called it a digital lens, or in the past, they called it the field of view of the camera, which you know, we know is basically the wide angle of the camera, and they, they have a built-in wide angle lens. But the way that they narrow that down, they do that digitally. Um, as I said, the digital lens is what they call it now. But really what that is, is they're actually um, squeezing down the resolution of the imager, uh, which used to be called digital zoom in the past. Um, and if you been using digital cameras for a while, you know that most people hate that because uh, you're reducing the resolution of the image or you're using a process called uh, pixel interpolation uh, to keep the same resolution, which can add grain, artificial grain. Anyway, using the full wide angle means you can run into issues with vignetting, which is basically seeing the image, the uh, dark around the size of your image. And I'll show an example of this. Um, and this is most apparent when you're using external macro lenses with the GoPro. Um, also, because it's fixed a fixed focus camera, it is much harder to take raw, uh, macro uh, photographs because now you have to be just like in the, uh, the days of film, you have to be a certain distance away from your subject for it to be in the sweet spot. Now, being a large imager, uh, a sorry, a small imager type camera, you have a much larger um, depth of field. Therefore, that sweet spot is much larger. So you're more apt to, to get within a good focus of the subject. But still, it takes practice. So let me quickly go over, and I actually took this photo this past weekend because I wanted a good one to, to explain um, some stuff. And I actually found another oddball thing uh, that can occur. Um, so you can see the vignetting, which is actually the, uh, the dark around the corners. And this is actually uh, caused by, well, let me back up. So, the external macro lens that I'm using uh, from Backscatter um, came out many generations of the GoPros in the past. But since then, GoPro has built wider and wider lenses into their cameras to the point that you 
you now, when you're forced to use wide angle for raw, you can see the edges of that uh, external lens. It's as simple as that. Why, now, there's an issue here that the, and, um, and Doc Scatter actually talks about this, that the only way around fixing this issue in camera is to change the lens to what's called linear, uh, which basically is that digital zoom I was talking about, one step down, so you don't see the edges of the lens. Unfortunately, to use raw, you can't do that using raw. So Baxter basically says, if you want to take macro photography, don't use raw right now. I say, just crop the image, fix it in Lightroom. That way you get the benefits. Um, and I'll actually show that very in just a minute. Um, but the other thing that can happen um, with any camera that is in a clear housing is the clear housing can actually carry light and it carries the light directly down into um, between the uh, external lens and your uh, primary lens. And that actually causes uh, this fun thing. Oops, I can actually get my marker to work. Yep, there we go. It was just a little slow. And, mm -hmm. and I tapped the, the thing. Now I'm actually going, well, you know, we, get, we gotta get these little issues out of the way when, when you're doing presentations. So if we can just jump back once. Yeah, there we go. So this can happen. Um, and this is, I, I've seen this in the old Olympus cameras, they had clear housings and stuff. So this can still happen with GoPros also. You can actually see the edge of the uh, internal lens um, of the GoPro itself. Um, once again, this would have to happen. This can only really would happen on a really bright day, which is typically when what you would see when you're diving the Caribbean or any other place that's nice and bright and warm, hopefully. So um, if I jump ahead and I get rid of my, uh, my sketches here, just to clean this up. Um, this is what it looked like, the same photo, uh, just going for some post-processing in Lightroom. Um, and I will just quickly go through some of that stuff. Um, so let me just highlight, you know, basic processing is the same, opening images in Lightroom, sort, uh, rate and sort your images, which I believe Ellen's going to be doing a presentation uh, right after me about. Um, and then you're developing the image. And, you know, the basics of that is crop rotate. As you saw, I was cropping to get rid of some of that vignetting. I actually cropped to get rid of the, the little uh, light leak issue that was occurring. Um, of course, orientation, uh, so you can compose your image, you know, make sure you give the fish a little swim room. Uh, then you get into white balance. Um, as with any underwater stuff, you do the white balance and then you might want to tweak it a little bit, twint, tint a little bit because it's not always, what you pick is not always, you know, the best. Um, and then you get into highlights, shadows, white balance, uh, sorry, white balance, whites and black. Um, sometimes I'll actually go back and I'll touch the exposure and contrast after that because uh, it's it's more it's more of a global control than than the more uh, specific highlight settings. Um, I typically do not try mess with the other settings unless I'm looking for a certain looking for a certain look. Uh, but when I do want to mess with colors and fine tune stuff, that's when I get into hue, saturation, luminance, which is a little bit more advanced because you're dealing with multiple sliders. And I can show a little bit of that, but I feel that's kind of some more advanced that uh, maybe Ellen is, I think Ellen has done that in the past uh, presentations and maybe in the future if now that uh, Adobe is adding new features to Lightroom. Um, the last one is very unique to the GoPro, which is lens correction. So if you're using a digital SLR underwater, um, the information on what lens you're using is actually incorporated in the photo. Lightroom actually sees that and automatically would um, auto, auto warp the lens uh, for what's called fisheye distortion or distortion from using wide angle lenses. Um, on the GoPro, uh, it doesn't happen automatically. You actually can go in and actually tell Lightroom, say, hey, I'm using a GoPro, apply, apply a de-warping. Uh, lens uh, profile. And I'll quickly show that. 
Now, underwater, you don't want to, you do want to adjust that a little bit because underwater, of course, uh, is its own lens, water itself. So the amount of dewarping you need to do is actually much less. Now, uh, oh, I have an example of dewarping. So this is, of course, a terrestrial photograph of using a GoPro. You can actually see the warping it does on the image where the horizon is basically warped um, like you would see with any wide angle lens or fisheye type lens. Um, a dewarping filter in Lightroom or many other applications will actually straighten that out so it looks more traditional if you're using a traditional standard type lens. Um, and it's much more presentable. Okay. So this is when I get into trying to do a live demo. This is when things can go wrong. Okay, so same image, our little crab. I tried to look, I tried looking for something much more interesting, um, but there were just so many crabs in abundance and he was sitting there so nicely that I figured it would work. Um, not to mention there were lobsters, but they were too far under holes. Okay, so anyway, we're starting out um, and I actually did a bunch of stuff so I can actually just jump to it. But of course you'd be using the normal, oops, why did I do that? The normal cropping tool. Um, you can set, of course, you know, what you want your aspect ratio to be in the, you know, this is the traditional five by seven aspect ratio. Um, System's a little slow because I'm because of running the uh, the zoom at the same time. But you can see that it's fairly easy to get a photograph and kind of filter out both the vignetting and the fun little light leak issue. So you know the next step: white balance. Um, I usually try a shell. You know, anything I know, it's going to probably be mostly white underwater. Shells are very good for that. Um, sand can work, of course. And then, you know, sometimes I will play with, and these are very small controls on my, my screen. So I'm probably going to really rack these around, just trying to use my mouse. But sometimes I do uh, adjust the tint just a little bit uh, because colors can get out, get out of hand. Uh, quite quickly. And then it's just a matter of adjusting what you feel brings out some of the hidden details, uh, which is going to mostly be in the highlight in your shadows. And of course I have my uh, control set so that if I go too far, I'll actually know when I am uh, pushing the boundaries too much. Um, of course, when I'm doing this, I'm actually looking at the photograph and I'm looking at the histogram, but that's just me. I, I, I watch the histogram as much as I look at the photograph because I know when I'm about to um, push the control too, too far. So that's the, the general uh, concept on the basics. Um, so let's quickly talk about the lens. And unfortunately, you know, I know this is very small for you and I will, I will do a quick thing at the end to, to bring this a little bit more in perspective, but we do have lens correction right here. Um, now, normally when you're in here, it's going to be under manual or it's going to be automatically selecting a profile. But in this case here, as soon as I select, I want to use a profile, it does see that it's a GoPro image. So that's incorporated into the metadata of the image itself. Um, but by default, it's going to be trying to apply 100% correction to it. And what that does, if I try to bring it up there, it actually, because water itself is a lens underwater, it's going to push the image way, it's going to warp the image more than you, de-warp the image more than you need. So what I'm finding, at least with the setup I'm using with that external um, lens, is about 50% 
um, straightens everything out, um, which is kind of useful for the crab because he's, he's pretty straight to begin with. Um, so that's one thing you should look at doing, uh, something additional to the GoPro, just the way it works. Um, I think that's, oh, I can go through, um, I'd rather not get into H HSL because it's a little tweaky for me to do in a presentation. Um, if I actually use some of the controls I have here, I can actually make it much easier. Uh, but this is sometimes, even with the GoPro, um, if you if the photo wasn't exposed right and you have to you have a green tint on things, um, using the HSL controls, you know, which is hue, saturation, luminance, is about the only way you can probably get some of the green tint out of certain photographs, uh, such as turtles or sometimes crabs and lobsters, depending on what you're taking a photo, trying to take a photograph of. Not that I take photographs of just those. Um, okay, let me jump back to my presentation. Hey, Finney, can I ask a question? Sure. So when you shoot in RAW, and if you don't have those nice uh, filters like you have, does RAW pick up enough data that then if you, uh, you know, you're on your computer working it, you can actually get to where you would have been without the lenses, uh, the filters? I mean, the color filters. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you can. Um, but like I said, sometimes you run into a situation where um, due to amount of ambient light you get and stuff like that, or if you had a strobe, you might have to use those additional color controls to get the rest of the green hue out of the image. Uh, but I do find that the raw file from the GoPro does contain enough other information to effectively use white balance to get rid of uh, the green tint. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so anyway, because, you know, anything can go wrong, try, trying to do a live demonstration stuff I did, I actually make a quick backup of doing going for that process. Uh, so the original photograph, but it actually turns out this is a slightly different photograph, but same, same issues. Um, the starting off the same controls, uh, you can see that um, it's an underexposed image. All the data, uh, looking at the histogram, is far to the left, uh, which is the dark range. Uh, crop the image, get rid of the, the vignetting, um, you know, basically hiding the crimes, as we sometimes call it. Um, white balance, sometimes tweaking the tint a little bit. Um, which does 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 help. You know, don't be scared of the controls because you can all you can always jump back with the history. Um, adjusting shadows. Uh, I think I pushed this one a little far. It's a little bright. Um, adjusting the normal normal controls. Um, you can actually get into using the presence controls, but a little bit goes a long way using the presence, which is of course the uh, controls down here. You know. It's something about these presentations that uh, it doesn't like. It doesn't like me using the stylus for some reason. Yeah, presence controls are these these guys down here. Um, so they do work quite well with the raw image off the go the GoPro. Just you know, just use them with little care because uh, you can go very you can blast the image very easily with just a little bit of those controls. Um, okay, so. Bring that up. Okay, so if you, if I jump back and forth here, you actually see, um, oops, one more, how much that GoPro lens profile actually helps. In this case, I mentioned I put it about 50% of the 100% slider that it defaults to. And it basically evens things out. Now, towards the edges, I do still see some distortion from the lens, but of course that is not from the GoPro lens itself as distortion being caused by the external close-up lens. 
And that's that was a quick presentation. Um, this was a fill-in presentation. I put this together fairly quickly because I think uh, Andy asked me to do this about a week and a half, two weeks ago, I think. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to throw something together. I thought this was kind of useful information for those that are using GoPros. I, you know, I bring the GoPro on vacations with me all the time. You know, I do try to use the features of it, and I did run into these things, so I thought people would be interesting, uh, interested. Uh, right. Any other questions? Yeah, I think it was fabulous. It's not a question, but I, uh, I think you did a great job with this. And this is, um, again, for especially uh, the people who are, are usually carrying a, a GoPro. Now you realize what you know what you can do with your image by uh, by shooting it uh, in RAW. That's terrific. Yeah. And you, it, I mean, don't expect a GoPro to replace a you know a, a larger camera. Um, you know, just due to having a fixed lens, it's it has limitations to it. But it's a great thing if you you know want to take video and you're only set up to take photography or something like that, or vice versa. If it's the only camera you have and you don't want to bring your large camera, you can use it quite effectively using the same Lightroom controls. Or if you don't want to carry much of a camera, you just want to have something in your hand for just in case. Well, this is perfect. Yeah. And or if you're going someplace where they don't allow you to bring enough luggage to bring your big camera. Whoa. Okay. Ooh. Do, do you find if you've got your gloves on, if you're in cold water, switching between uh, photo and video on the GoPro in that case is difficult? It can be. Uh, I do find the buttons on their, their clear dive housing are, you know, of course, about the same size as the camera itself, maybe a little bit larger. I do find that I do have problems where I'm thinking pressing the button, I'm pressing the button because I can't really feel it with thick gloves, um, that I'm not, and I have to look at it and then reorient my finger and then it works fine. Um, of course, it really depends on the thickness of your gloves. Um, the biggest issue is using the button combinations on the GoPro where you press both the side button and the top button at the same time to access some of the menus. That is a little bit harder, I do find. Um, you know, it would be great if, you know, you could actually get a external control or something uh, to make it easier to access some of that stuff. But, you know, that's just another thing you, you could easily lose or have to bring with you. Or maybe have some sort of a for lack of a better term, a little rod or something that you could put on a lanyard with the camera so that you could pick that up and sort of like as a, as a pointer, but press the button with that. But if you're talking about to access a menu, you're talking about pressing two buttons or that. Yeah. And it, gets, and it gets to be a little tough. So, you know, the actual answer uh, to that type of issue is you can actually go to a hardware store and get the clear little um, buttons that are designed for the feet of things. Uh, they're literally, you know, if you had a pitcher or a clock or something like that, you put them as little bumper feet on the bottom. You can't actually buy ones that are small enough to actually stick on those buttons. Therefore, they're raised a little bit further. And just having them raised a little bit allows you to orient your finger and actually press directly on them much easier. I do that on a lot of my cameras. Um, and it actually eliminates the, some of those issues, but still pressing two buttons at once is more of the problematic issue. But the the one button, those type of adding that little extra detent for the uh, little rise for the button helps a lot. Oh, very good, good tip. La last question: Do you use uh, moisture? What do they call them? moisture eaters in the GoPro case? I have. I do actually have them. I bought a bunch of them when I got the GoPro. Um, I have not used them in New England. Um, but when you go to the Caribbean and stuff, where you might have the go, you might be setting up the GoPro inside an air conditioned uh, space and then going outside where it's warm and humid, you definitely should use them. Uh, because it being a clear housing and stuff, it's going it's to fog up. Uh, even as small as it is. So they're really thin little things that they just stick on the side is what GoPro sells. And of course, they make a hefty profit, you know, selling them. But they do work. I would recommend you use them when you're 
in warm tropical conditions and stuff because you're gonna have more humidity issues in the housing. And, you know, it's a simple thing to do. All right, Dale, thank you. Thank you okay. very much. That was very, very good. And now if we have, as I mentioned earlier in the very beginning, if you have now thousands of images and you're trying to find them, and even if it's from one vacation or just your collection for the summer, uh, how do you how do you organize them? And check out the uh, the way in which Ellen is going to show us how to do it. So Ellen, I'll turn this over to you. It's quite a collection here of photos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I just randomly picked things, you know, back in the day, you might have had prints of these or slides of these, but now we've got this stuff. So how do you, um, how do you organize your photos? Um, I'm going to discuss, uh, th there are lots and lots of ways to do this. Um, I'm going to try to keep it simple and, and give pretty much just one way, but talk about what's going on behind the scenes. So if something else works for you then go for that. So um, I gotta, first I got to figure out where, huh, it's not advancing, there we go. So we start with a camera, whether that's uh, you know an a, the actual camera or the camera in your phone. And the first thing you're gonna wanna do is get the images off of your camera and onto your, onto your computer, to an external drive, to wherever you're gonna store it doesn't all need to be on the same storage device, but for the sake of uh, experimentation I'm gonna, or uh, illustration, I'm just gonna pretend that we have, it's on our storage device and uh, typically on a PC that's in the pictures folder. You might have some images there. You might have some subfolders, some sub subfolders, images all over the place. And what you're gonna wanna do is copy the images off of your camera and onto that storage device. I like to do that just using whatever normal copy uh, tools you have, whether that's Internet Explorer or whatever, just to move them from point A to point B. And then um, Lightroom comes along on your computer. You've got Lightroom. And when you do a Lightroom import, what that does is it, it, it takes, there's a file called the catalog file. And as, as I say here, this is, this little symbol means approximately, uh, the specific name of that may have the version of Lightroom. You make, you can put your own name on it, but it's, it's the Lightroom catalog. And what goes into that catalog is a map of where your images are. So your images stay over here in these where you had them. And this catalog just knows that that picture is in that location. And then um, it also picks up the metadata. And that means the, the some of it, the metadata that comes off the camera, things like the date, assuming you've got that capability in your camera and that you've set the date, the file name, um, what camera it was, what exposure it used, all that good stuff is also um, then becomes part of the Lightroom catalog. The other thing that it does when you do that import is it creates a uh, thumbnail of your photo. And I'll talk about why that's important later. But basically a thumbnail is a small, quick image that it can uh, pull up you know, pictures very, very quickly just using the thumbnails rather than having to go back to the original photo. And then once you've got your stuff in Lightroom, then you're gonna go through the developing like Daryl just illustrated and, and Andy talked about last week. And what that does is it, when you do that development, you do a white balance or adjusting the exposure or the shadows or whatever, it makes a list of changes for each image and puts that in this database, this Lightroom catalog. That's important because it does not modify your image. And this is the most important thing to wrap your head around if you're new to Lightroom um, or if you, you know, if you're new to Lightroom, it, wrap your head around the fact that it's not touching your image. So it's, it knows where the image is, it knows what to do with it, and that's what you see on your computer. 
does not change the image. And it also, um, the other thing that goes into this catalog here are attributes that you can add. So you can add a title, a caption, a keyword, and I'll get into that in just a minute. So this is, this is the big picture of, of what's going on in terms of where the data is. Um, and I'm gonna do the, oh, I'm sharing the wrong screen. Hang on, I shared my screen as opposed to my desktop. So let me share my desktop instead. Thought I was being so clever. Uh, hmm. And now I'm gonna fire up Lightroom, which I didn't do ahead of time. Remember Daryl talked about uh, doing live demos, always, always dangerous. <laughs> Very true. Very Super true. dangerous. Yes. I'm only gonna do it this one, <laughs> this one piece, just because I wanna show you how easy that, that import is. And I wanna show a few other things. So um, uh, you can see my Lightroom screen now? Yep. Okay. So just a quick review of what you see with Lightroom. Here are all my um, images for a particular area. On the left, this is a mirror of my disk. These photos, I actually keep them all on my computer as opposed to an external drive. And this is the structure on, on my computer, it mirrors that. But Lightroom knows, so Lightroom knows what's in all of these folders. And if I, if I click on one of those, uh folders it's going to pull up you know there are my cat pictures or whatever um on the right here this is uh an, um some information about that i'll and i'll get into that a little more but you can see the histogram and a few other things there and then the top and the bottom also have things and you can these little arrows, and you can see, I'll, I'll use one over here. So this arrow over here, all the way on the left, if I click that, that takes that makes that left panel go away. And if I click it again, it makes it come back. And same with the right, so you can decide what to do there. But what I'm gonna do is, and this is an import. So I took a bunch of random photos and threw them into a folder. And I'm going to import that now. Um, so here's import photos and videos. It's going to pull up um, my uh, my computer, and I'm going to navigate to where I know that I put those folders. If I can assume that I can remember where I put those folders. So under me, under pictures. And I usually keep a garbage area there. So here's one photo society on that date. So I click it. This is what it sees on my computer. I can choose to import all of these or select which ones I want to import. And I'm going to import them. And now that's done. So it's pulled all of these photos in. Um, and, and it knows that they're in this folder right here. In, and you can see they're random. So this is the organization. You know, if you haven't been organizing your photos, you're going to get some random stuff like this. If we look down here, I talked about the metadata uh, down here at the bottom of this um, panel on the right. You'll see uh, a bit of metadata that it shows. You know, with the file name and the folder when it was taken and um, the dimensions. You can customize which things you see here. We can get it more things, but that's uh, that's basically the import process. So if, if you're brandy new to Lightroom, you can point this at your entire picture folder and it will just pull everything in and then you'll be ready to rip. I'm gonna go back now to the slideshow. Um, so I did all of that. So the metadata, I showed you this live, but this is maybe um, uh, a little easier to see, a little bit bigger. So this is the information that, that travels with the photo and some of it is supplied by the camera, all of this kind of stuff. There are actually about 150 things that come with it, but all of these uh, popular items uh, you can see would be 
really useful to have about that. And then the way um, I mentioned that they're in the file, this is um, just to demonstrate that quickly. This is a from file from Windows uh, File Explorer. I'm sure there's a similar thing on the on the um, Macs. No, they don't want you to know what's going on. But if you're in Windows, you can find out what's going on. This is the properties on the actual file. And you'll see, um, if you're a Windows person, you see this scroll, oops, oops, don't hit it. Um, you can see how many there are. The scroll bar isn't even halfway through and there's all this kind of stuff that has come through. Uh, you know, if you've got GPS underwater, that doesn't really help you that much. But if your your camera's doing uh, got GPS in it, it'll tell you where the where it was taken. You can see that it knows what kind of camera it was, the model, the serial number, and everything about the 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 uh, photo. So metadata is really important. And then how could we use metadata? Well, you can see I've come in here to my pictures folder, which has thirty four thousand. Um, plus uh, pictures in it. And what I can do is then uh, filter that by using some of that uh, metadata. And in this case, uh, things like date, I can just say, show me, I don't care where they are, show me everything tape taken in April. Uh, or I could have selected a particular day. I can uh, choose it by camera, by lens. All of that metadata is up for grabs when you're searching for things. So that might be useful to you. But what's probably even more important are attributes that you can add. And, and I'll just put it out there that I think the ones that would be most uh, useful are keywords so that you could identify what something is and then a rating. So you come back from a trip or a dive or, or a walk in the woods and you've even if you've got 30, 40 photos, you might take a quick pass through and just put a, this one to five stars. You know, it's just a random thing. You get to choose what one means, what five means. And you can do a quick search and then and then maybe you, you know, I typically go through and I'll I'll then say, all right, now let's go back and look at the ones that I thought were ones or fives and 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 go from there. But it's totally up to you what you use that for. Some other things that you might want to use um, would be a title or a caption. You can uh, put those in there. You can actually rename the file. So it comes, you know, we've got the the camera name here, you, or the file name here, you can see came out of the camera as a P942, blah, 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 blah. I could change that. Um, and when I do that, that file name, obviously the file itself on the computer changes. And of course, Lightroom then calls it by that, but it also keeps um, track of what the original file name was so that you could get back to that if you needed to. And then um, labels, I have another presentation with a workflow that uses labels. So I'm gonna skip that, but that's another one that you might wanna use. Again, it's up to you what those labels mean, but um, we'll, go, we'll go with just that stuff. So um, what I, I then wanna come to is we talked, I talked about putting keywords in. I think some, some things that would be useful as keywords uh, what it is. So in this case, uh, this is Mantis. Uh, where it is, if you um, if you went on a trip, you might want to throw, you know, if you went to Fiji, you might want to throw Fiji in as a keyword on every file, every um, picture that you took there. So you can say, you know, show me, I can go through and say, um, find me all the Mantis uh, in Fiji just like that. And you're going to get them there. Um, I know Andy does things like puts colors in and then if he needs a picture of a red fish, he can do that. Uh, I don't generally do that, but you know, you can, you can put anything you want to in, in the meta, uh, in that keyword. And then the rating I mentioned. So here's the case where I'm searching for all of the mantis trips that are five stars over what you know, and that that search can take place 
I'll, I'll be bold and go back to Lightroom and actually do that search. So I can come here to pictures. I can search for Mantis and I can search for five stars. And you see how quickly that came up. Um, it pulled up, what, 15, 15 pictures out of 34,000 just that quickly. And then I can figure out which Mantis shrimp I want. And then the other thing um, over here on the right, uh, what kind of file it is, whether it's a video or, um, or a still right here, this is a video, the original photo, I'll get to that one in a second, or a video. So if I wanted five-star videos of Mantis shrimp, I'm out of luck. Um, but there you go. So the important metadata that you do not want to add is the stuff that's already there. So you don't, you shouldn't go around putting the date and time, for example, into, in, in as, as your own metadata, because you've already got all of that. Uh, this list of metadata that I've got instant filters on, that list is something I control. I'll go back to the live thing since it's actually working, except that I didn't have any videos of Mantis shrimp. Um, if I wanna search for metadata, I can add, let's say um, the camera, the EPM one. So now I've got all of the Mantis shrimp uh, we'll go with five stars taken with an EPM one, no matter where they were. So don't go adding the stuff that's already there. Only add things that, um, that you know that, that it isn't going to know from the computer. I mean, from the, from the camera. So what did I want to say here? Hmm. I don't remember what I wanted to talk about when I made this slide. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Now I remember. Um, coming back to this original picture, you've got your file structure on your computer or your storage device. And what should this structure be? These subfolders and images and all of that. That was what I wanted to say here. You can see I've got this picture pile of all kinds of stuff. How should I organize that on the computer? And the answer is that it doesn't matter, mostly. It doesn't matter, you've just seen that I can search across all the folders on my computer in instant, you know, instantaneously and find all the five-star mantis shrimp um, right away. So it doesn't matter because you'll always be able to find it, mostly using the metadata and the attributes. However, that works, that, um, that search works within the folder. So you may want some level of organization. I was searching from the top level, but maybe I wanted to search um, within a particular uh, trip that I had done and organized it that way. And more importantly, maybe, Maybe you're not great about keywording absolutely everything. I mean, I, I keyword my underwater stuff pretty religiously, not all of it, just the, you know, like the five stars, the four stars, uh, so that I can find that uh, mantis shrimp. But I'm not going to keyword my cats. So I put all my cats under a folder and then I can go to the cats folder. Um, and then um, what I like to do is the other the other thing with with uh, where you put your photos is keeping track of um, particularly on trips or I mean just even around you get you pull out your camera you take a photo or you you've got your cell phone you take a photo and you've got to do that first transfer to get it to your computer now you're on a trip I like to do that every day um, but maybe you got maybe you got too busy and you didn't do that one day. How do you 
or maybe you did it halfway during the day. You don't, how do you know which ones you've actually transferred to your computer and which ones are, are still stuck there? So if you have what some way of organizing it, that's great. What I like to do is for trips um, is, is put the name of the trip and then a folder for each day underneath that. And then I know, oh yeah, the, the 13th, I already uploaded all of those or imported all of those, I should say. Got them off of the, got them off of the camera, put them onto my computer and then imported them into Lightroom. I'll know, I don't even have to import a Lightroom. I know that if I've got that folder there, the, the photos from the 13th are there. So whatever organization helps you keep track um, at a very high level of, of where your, your um, photos are is fine. And then to, cert to find things, you're actually gonna be using then all of that metadata and the attributes. Um, so coming back to um, the way things are organized, we have, remember that, that Lightroom keeps track of where your images are. Once you have pulled your stuff into Lightroom, you need to drink the Kool-Aid and only use Lightroom to move the files. Don't go into another app or into your um, you know, Finder if you're on a Mac or Explorer on a PC and start moving files around because Lightroom knows where it is. And if you move it out from underneath it, Lightroom is going to say, what? Where is it? Now, the good news is you can actually tell Lightroom where it is, but if you're moving stuff out from underneath it, um, that's that's kind of a, a you know why why are you doing that? Once you've got it in Lightroom, drink the Kool Aid and move it within Lightroom, and that's easy enough. Um, if I go back to my um, to these guys and I want to move. Uh, I want to move these cats to Ambon. I just drag it and drop it. And it will, um, it warns me that I'm actually moving it on the disc. Now, I'm not going to actually move the cats to Ambon because they're, they're not going. That was a joke. <laughs> Is anybody there? Yeah. We are. <laughs> okay. All right. Just, just testing. See if it, all right, and um, I would be remiss in talking about organizing photos if I didn't talk about um, backing up your photos. So you'll want to use your normal backup system. Everybody has that, right? You're backing up, so happening automatically. Maybe you're using file history on a PC and it's doing it every 20 minutes, maybe. Anyway, hopefully you've got a normal backup system. You can use that to back up the photos and the Lightroom catalog. Um, you don't bother when you exit Lightroom, it will offer to back up the catalog. Um, that's really a, you know, a, an, it, it's not really backing it up as in protecting against failed hardware. It's making a copy in case you make some royal screw up and go to want to go back to where things were yesterday. But if you've got a proper backup system, you'll be able to do that anyway. And that's, I've never had to do that. So don't bother when it offers to back up the catalog and don't bother to back up the thumbnails. Um, that's a lot of little files and they are trivially recreated should you lose, should you lose them for some reason. Um, if you're on the road, like if you're on a trip, um, you should be making a copy of everything, uh, Lightroom catalog, as well as your photos on a portable media or of some sort. The um, usual statement, if you don't have it twice, you don't have it. Or some people will say, if you don't have it three times, you don't have it. Things do fail. So be sure and do that. Um, and coming back to what I said originally, that Lightroom doesn't modify your images, that's really cool because once it does a backup of that, it's done. It's not, if you go in and do develops and add attributes or do all sorts of stuff, it doesn't need to back that stuff up again because it's already done it. 
Um, I'm going to try to get through this really quickly. So um, if you want to have a, see an image in some other way, so maybe you've got uh, maybe you're doing a presentation that, that, or you're submitting a photo somewhere that needs a different crop than what you've had in the past or a different aspect ratio, or you want to look at a black and white. What you do is you make a, a virtual copy. Do not, you don't have to make a copy of the photo because remember Lightroom has, where is the photo? What do we do to it? It can also keep track of a virtual copy that you develop in some other way. Um, so if I'll just come back here real quickly. If I wanted to um, make, I can make a virtual copy, create a virtual copy. And now you can see I've got two copies of this um, RAS. And then if I wanted to see, um, wanted to make a black and white. Now I've got Lightroom knows about these two copies of, of that fish. There's only one photo on the computer, but Lightroom has got two sets of instructions for what to do with that fish. So obviously I could do a crop, I could do most anything. So this is the way you, you don't need to make copies of your photos. And my last segment um, is that if you then want to make, um, if you're doing, say you're doing a slideshow and you want to pull out the photos that you're going to use for that slideshow, you make a collection. and. Um, so we have here our catalog, which we've been through what that has. And then the last thing that it does is create a collection, which is a list of images from the catalog. Those images can be all over the place. They can be, they don't have to be in the same folder. They can be everywhere. Um, so you collect them and you, you group those images that you want into a collection for whatever purpose. It's not a copy of those images. It's just like a, Hey, go, we're going to use that one and that one and that one. And um, so it just, it just points to them and any editing changes that you make while you're looking at a collection, um, they go with that photo. Lightroom knows about them. Here's the, the map of where your images are and list of changes. So if I'm in a collection and I do make, turn something into a black and white, that's, that's what Lightroom knows that image wants to do. Similarly, if I'm in, if I'm back in uh, looking at the file structure and I take an image and I make it black and white, and that image is in a collection, that change is going to show up in the collection. So very powerful. You never have to make a copy of anything in order to organize them. And then you can put them in whatever order you want, um, as opposed to the you know the way they're stored on your computer. And that's it. Um, that's kind of a whirlwind. So the collections are down here. If I wanted to make a collection of these two photos, I could say, create a new collection. I call it demo, include those two photos. And there it is. And now I've got a collection down here that I can manipulate whatever way I want. And that's where I'll stop. Well, that was excellent. Very, very good. And uh, uh, I've heard it said so many, uh, many times that, you know, if, although Lightroom is one of the, one of the best, uh, one of the good, uh, photo editing software, but its strength is what Ellen has been going over. Its strength is really not so much in the photo editing, which it does extremely well. It's the organizational stuff. Uh, and that's where it ex excels. And as far as drinking the Kool-Aid, as, uh, <laughs> as Ellen knows, I was reluctantly uh, uh, 
drinking the Kool-Aid. I, I fought because I wanted to do it my own way. And then I realized I was just causing much more trouble. So finally, I uh, sat down and drank the Kool-Aid and uh, life has been better. I think I had to tell you about six times, Andy, just drink the Kool-Aid. Just drink the Kool-Aid. It'll be good. <laughs> what flavor is it? Pardon me? What flavor is that Kool-Aid? Oh, it was kind of bitter in the beginning. I forget. <laughs> but afterwards, it was good. I have to admit. So. All right. So now um, I'm going to turn this uh, segment over to Matt because uh, PJ is a longtime friend of Matt's. So um, he will do better justice to, to the introduction. So Matt? Yeah, so uh, next up, we're gonna hear from PJ. Like uh, Andy was just saying, PJ and I go uh, pretty far back. He's one of the guys that first got me into diving myself. Um, so he's done a bunch of dives with me before, helped me get into photography as well at the same time. So um, looking very forward to uh, seeing his presentation here. He's gonna be doing his 10 favorite photos, mostly centering around his trip to the Maldives last year. So. Uh, PJ, go ahead. Thank you, Matt. I think you're flattering me a little bit there to say that I got you into photography, but I, I appreciate that. Um, so let me, I will confess, it has been a good two years since I have shared my screen over Zoom. So are you guys seeing that okay? Yep. Uh, yeah. Presentation. Um, so I'm going to be showing uh, some of the pictures that I took on a trip to the Maldives that I did back in February um, on the Mantheri live aboard uh, 10 days, nine nights. Um, I took all these pictures just with my Olympus TG5, you know, point and shoot compact. Um, I was alternating between um, a wide angle lens that I had with some dual um, sea life strobes uh, um, that I had been borrowing from my mom. Um, and then I had done most of the macro photography that I did with the Kraken We Find, I think 300 ring light um, that I've gotten really comfortable with and I, I really enjoy. Um, I will probably just jump and kind of burn through the pictures. Um, some of them, I have to admit, have not been edited just yet. Um, Matt asked me to do this a while back and I made the mistake of not considering the fact that I start school on Monday. Um, so I'm a little bit wrapped up, but, um, I love the photos nonetheless. So, um, there was a lot of things in the Maldives that I just had not seen before. And one of those that really jumped out at me was just this, um, I think it was a, a spiral anemone, um, and, I, I had really hoped that I could get the clownfish in the background a little bit better in focus, but it, the translucence of the anemone really jumped out at me. Um, so let me jump forward. Um, I'd never actually seen um, one of these oriental sweet lip before. And it was really interesting to see, I actually, in hindsight, probably should have included a picture of the juvenile. Um, because it was really startling to me um, when the dive master had pointed out just how much they changed between their adolescence and um, adult forms. I, I had no concept that they were even vaguely related to each other, um, but I really like the vibrant color that they, they have. Um, let's see. This trip for me was really the trip of... Um, the Nudebranc, I had really been wanting to improve my spotting skills and I hadn't seen very many. I still um, have not actually been able to get a Nudebranc locally. I think I'm a little bit too much of a baby on the, the, cold, um, the cold water, but I'm hoping that I can push myself out um, this coming fall into the winter. Um, but the variety that we had on the, the Nudibranx, I think we probably saw a different one at least every day. I mean, I was just completely blown away. And I'm sure that, you know, um, we probably swam by 
five for every one that we spotted. Um, it was a lot of fun just kind of picking these out. And some of the people on the trip were just phenomenal. They were really only there for the Nuda Bronx um, once we had our first couple spottings. Um, and they got really good. I really enjoyed this, this picture. Um, I got a couple um, sequential shots of it, of this flounder kind of um, diving off this, um, I don't know if that's a tabletop coral formation, um, but I kind of like the movement that it, it had shown. Um, I think Daryl had talked earlier and I found it really helpful um, about the vignetting at the edge of the image. Um, I, with the ring light that I had, you know, had to use a couple adapters to um, get it onto the front of the camera and um, ended up needing to, I think I just forgot to crop a couple of these, but um, I found it really helpful to, you know, hear him talking about that. And I actually have not made the jump to Lightroom yet. I've been using something that Matt had recommended to me, which is Photoscape X. Um, but it's definitely something that I'd like to jump into, especially having seen how um, the organization works. That's certainly something that I've struggled with in the past on my, my photos. Like I said, this was a fantastic Nudebrank trip. Um, I had so much fun finding um, some of these really, you know, to me, unique um, creatures that just look like they could be part of the, the fauna, um, or I guess flora. Um, you know, the, the um, shapes and colors and sizes that they came in really, really astounded me. <clears throat> we'll hop on. Um, this was one of the pictures, or I guess one of the, the moments on the trip that really stood out for me. Um, let me see if I can figure out how to use a pointer. Huh. Um, so I think, you know, pretty clearly on the little left of center here, we have um, that octopus and it's reaching its tentacle over. If you can see, uh, I believe we had a female octopus over there. Um, and I got some really interesting video too um, of the two of them um, engaging with each other. Um, none too pleased about, about our presence. Um, I had never really seen, you know, octopus um, interacting with each other like this. So um, it was really interesting to, to get that um, and be able to, you know, capture it. Um, for good measure, I, I wanted to throw in another octopus picture. I just love octopus. Um, and I was really um, pleased with kind of the framing of this. I'm a fairly new underwater photographer, and this was kind of the first trip that things started to connect with me. Coincidentally, also the first time that um, I had the ability to use two strobes. Um, so I guess when everyone was saying, lighting, 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 and two if you can get them, um, there's, there's some foundation to that. Um, but I really liked the way that it was kind of hanging off of this coral formation. Um, I'd like to kind of drop down some of the, the overexposure at the surface up on the, the top, but um, I liked kind of the gradient that it gave as you kind of drop down the, uh, the reef wall there. This was one of the spots um, that one of the dive masters picked out. We actually dove this site twice. And the first time around, um, this, this little leaf fish was just not in a good spot to get a picture. But um, fortunately, we came back uh, the next day. And it was just one of my favorite, um, favorite things that I've, I've photographed. It, it was so interesting to kind of try and time the waves as it, you know, fluttered around and just kind of went with the current. Um, and it really just popped. Um, I, I really love the, the camera for the macro photography that I've been able to do um, with it. I will confess this is not quite um, up to, to par with some of the pictures that Ellen um, popped up just in thumbnails, but 
Um, I was really excited for this one. This was actually the first um, peacock mantis shrimp that I've ever um, ever seen, ever spotted. Unfortunately, no one else on the dive was nearby and I couldn't really get anybody while it was um, scuttling by, but I thought it was really exciting to get it um, out in the open like this. You know, I didn't quite get the, the head on um, shot that, that um, really highlights just how blue those, um, those eyes are, but um, it was really exciting to spot that. And um, I definitely got some, uh, some flack when we got back up on the boat and pulled that picture up. I don't think any um, warm water trip uh, presentation would be complete without a, a, a turtle picture. Um, this was one of my favorite ones from the trip. Uh, this guy was kind of just lazing around on uh, a site that they called the graveyard. Uh, we had probably a half a dozen um, stonefish that were just scattered throughout the site. At one point, I just kind of looked up and there were three of them, just one after another, kind of chasing each other across. Um, it, was, it was a really interesting dive site. Um, but this guy was just kind of hanging out at the surface, you know, 20, 25 feet, kind of unfazed by us. This was again at the same site as the leaf fish. Um, that first day that we had done the dives, we all kind of just dropped down on this spot at the end. And they had told us, um, you know, there's a chance that we can find some tiger mantis shrimp. Um, but right at the end of the dive, we dropped down over this little ledge um, onto a little sandy patch. And I think we all saw the holes, we swam right up and then immediately it was gone. Um, didn't manage to get any pictures. So we came back the next day and we all just went nuts with, with these. Um, there are actually two um, tiger mantis holes that we found. Um, and it was really interesting on the first day, you know, I shined, shined my light down the hole once it had buried itself back down and it, it must have gone for at least a good eight or 10 feet that, um, that I could see. I, I was really blown away. I mean, it was just a perfectly round hole straight down as deep as I could see. Um, I actually didn't have lights for this or, you know, attached lighting. And so I had actually kind of just pulled my, um, you know, kind of um, narrow beam handheld flashlight um, up over it to see if I could could light it up. And I really liked the way that it had kind of cast across uh, and really got the the eyes of that um, tiger mantis. And that are, I think I threw in a, an extra one. So we'll say eleven pictures. Um, but that was my presentation. Oh, very, very nice. Looks like you had a great trip. It was a blast. Yeah, I'd love to go back. Um, one of the, the dive masters actually messaged me trying to convince me to come back in November. Um, they had a, a room open up and I unfortunately was not able to, to take him up on that, but I'd love to go back someday. Yeah, it's on my on my bucket list. I've not, not been there yet, but hope to. Yeah. Well, Ellen, Daryl, PJ, wonderful. Thank you for nice presentations. Um, really great stuff, thanks. Yeah, very informative, pretty, and uh, and definitely useful. So I, I thank you. Um, next, I don't even, can't even at the top of my head, can't even think of what's coming up next. Uh, but anyway, I will... Uh, We'll see everyone on the next lecture. No, I know what I'm presenting next, but so I'm doing Cuba and who else is doing something tonight? Somebody from this group or somebody presenting in July? I'll have to look at that. Anyway, um, thanks for tuning in. And oh, oh, one more thing. Now that I, that's what I wanted to say. In the uh, few meetings ago, we had uh, something where everyone uh, added their information and, and gave one, uh, we had one big presentation. And what we're thinking of for the last meeting is to, we'll have one presentation, and usually we have three, we'll have one, and then the last two, that slot, a double slot, would be how to prepare for a, a photo dive trip. 
Yes. So if we could all share um, things that we find are, are very helpful. So even though I know that's not until October, but start thinking about it. Um, you can either send me some information or uh, pass it on to Matt. And um, it, it's something because we, we're all into underwater photography. And if you're into underwater photography, you travel. So it's always the, the nightmare, the nightmare of how to pack, how to do all that, what to bring. And then the, the other nightmare is you get there and you realize you forgot this or the one thing broke. So um, that's sort of the kind of thing we'll uh, be addressing just so that um, we can all make our own. I know I, I make a list of things to bring, a checklist, and I keep it and then modify it as time goes by. But uh, I, I find it real helpful. But when I hear other people, uh, when I see their lists and you see what kind of things that they bring that and all of a sudden it's a great idea. So I add that on to, to my list. But on the other end of it is the hard, fast limit of what we can put in luggage. So that's, so anyway, be thinking about that, put it on the back burner so we can uh, put together a nice uh, final meeting of, of the year on getting us ready for winter, spring, or uh, summer travels. Okay. I know we have a few Philippine travelers on this, uh, this group right here. Okay, so thanks again, uh, presenters, those of you for tuning in, and uh, see you next month. <laughs>